Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. We return to the study of Paul's letter to the Church of Rome. We've come to the point in the book of, of Romans where we see, begin to see a transition happening in the, in the book. In the first four chapters, Paul presented to the Romans the power of God in giving salvation to all who believed, both Jews and Gentiles are sinners. And Paul was quite detailed in his instructions that all have sinned, Jews and Gentiles both, and require salvation. There was no advantage to being a Jew or a Gentile in, uh, in, light of sal- in, in, the, in the world of salvation. There was no salvific advantage. Remember our historical context. Paul had completed his Eastern Mediterranean uh, push, planted churches and established mission points all around the Eastern Mediterranean. Antioch, Syrian Antioch, uh, served as the regional headquarters for the mid uh, or for the Eastern Mediterranean uh, region. Paul wanted Rome to be the regional headquarters for the West Mediterranean outreach. And Paul's goal was to train the Romans to understand the gospel message. So he's been focusing on the gospel message so that Rome, made up of both Jews and Gentiles in the church there, would understand salvation and be the place to be the center for reaching the Western Med. To make sure they could be effective missionaries and missionary senders. If you... If you look at the totality of the book of of Romans, Paul could have ended his message to the Romans and completed that goal at the end of chapter 4. He'd he'd met his goal of making sure that the the Romans understood salvation. But he doesn't. He continues on. In chapter 5, Paul turns to discuss peace with God. That's the title of the message this morning. The gospel brings peace. Peace with God is what the gospel produces in the person who receives the gospel message. Some New Testament scholars look at chapter 5 as a, as a bridge in the musical composition. You know, when you're, when you're singing a song and, and, and it's really energetic for a long time and then there's that, that bridge where it's just the music for a while, gives the singer a chance to regroup and, regroup and, and breathe. A lot of New Testament scholars look at chapter 5 as being a bridge in Paul's hard-hitting attack in in the book of uh, Romans. Slowing down the pace of what was coming just a bit so that you can sit back and grab a breath. Peace is an important topic for Paul. So important, it's almost the number one thing that he talks about in his letters. He mentions peace 50 times, five zero times throughout his letters. Peace is that important of a topic. When we think about salvation, it's almost always in the vein of the benefits of salvation. It would be normal to think of peace with God as a benefit to receiving salvation. But I think Paul is arguing that peace with God is not a benefit. It is the benefit. It's not a benefit, but the benefit of salvation. Think about it this way. Absent God's grace and mercy, we're at war with God and will ultimately be executed for our war crimes. That's where we stand before salvation. Convicted by God and sentenced to death as his enemy. Only when we're at peace with God, when God's grace provides us salvation, 
will that death penalty be lifted. Peace with God can be viewed as the benefit of salvation that everything else is wrapped up in. Are you? The, the result of the gospel is peace. The result of everything the gospel does is you stand in a position where God has justified you and made you able to be at peace with him. If you were to do a deep dive into the entomology, etymology, I'm sorry, uh, of, um, of the Greek word eugelion, which is what we, what we translate as peace, or I'm sorry, as gospel, euangelion, gospel, you discover some interesting factoids. Euangelion originally meant the reward paid to the runner that was delivering the message. <coughs> Sorry about that. Losing my voice. The marathon race is 26.2188 miles because a runner in war had to run that far to deliver a message. I didn't know this before, but as I was researching this, I discovered that, that as you were delivering a message, if it was good news, you got a reward. That's the word euangelion. It's that reward for delivering the good news. If you brought bad news, like it's your fault, right? You're not the guy making the news. You're just delivering the news. But if you delivered bad news, the general had the right to kill you, or he had the right to give you a new message and send back. So in the case where the, where the marathon comes from, 26.2 miles there. Hey, here's the news. <laughs> Take this message back, 26.2 miles back. And then they killed you. You didn't want to deliver bad news. There was a reward for delivering good news. Bringing good news brought the reward. Bad news brought punishment. And ultimately a return with new instructions. Over time, the word euangelion, gospel, became associated with the news itself and not the reward. I'm fascinated by Paul following up the first four chapters of the, of the book of Romans where he's talking about, the, about salvation, where he's talking about the gospel message. He follows that up with peace. He hits it hard for four chapters. The gospel message. And he follows it up with peace. In which, in, in, as he's talking about peace, he's making a solid case for the gospel bringing peace between God and us. The good news is that God has already won the battle and provided a way for peace with him. Our mission is to proclaim to the world how to have peace with God. So let's dig into Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Nineteen times in the book of Romans, Paul begins a section with therefore. Well, Vernon used to tell me, when you see therefore in Scripture, you've got to look what it's there for. What is the link? What's he doing? What's he connecting here in the text? Paul transitions thoughts with the word therefore. Paul presented the need for justification by God in chapter 1, verse 8, through chapter 3, verse 20. Then in 3.21 through 4.25, he presented the means for justification, faith. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we are now at peace with God. The result of God's justification of us is peace. Notice in, in this verse, Paul switches vantage points. He had been talking in third person, and he'd been talking about others, and now he goes to first person, and he says, therefore, since we 
have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the first four chapters, you or they is used 77 times by Paul. And we is only used 15 times. Paul makes the transition to indicate that he's a party to the peace God provides. We're all in this together. We all have united peace with God. Peace with God comes to those who are justified by faith. And he includes himself in that number. There is a textual issue in uh, verse 1. It's not clear if the text should read, we have peace or let us have peace. The reason I say it's not clear is because the Greek manuscripts, the early copies of the manuscripts we have, have a variant. It's a one-letter variant, but it's a variant nonetheless. The one-letter difference changes the text from we have to let us have. I'm, I, I admit, I'm not a great grammarian, I, and especially in Greek, really especially in Hebrew. Um, and so I have to rely on, on experts to, to guide me on this. It would seem to me, though, that the context demands that we have peace rather than let us have peace. The grammar of the verse would seem to indicate that Paul is declaring that we have peace, not the injunction to get peace. If he's saying, let us have peace, he's telling us, let's, let's strive to have peace. No, he's saying the result of justification by God is that you now have peace with God. Not that you are able to seek peace. So it seems like the context would demand that we have peace would be the right way to view that. Consider the difference peace with God makes to the Roman believers. I want you to try to immerse yourself in what it would be like to be a Christian in Rome in 50 or 60 AD. Pax Romana is one of the great things that came from the Roman um, Empire, the peace of Rome. But that didn't really apply to the Christians and the Jewish Christians living in Rome. Pax Romana began under Caesar Augustus. He was the one that, remember, he's the one that forced Mary to, at nine months pregnant, to travel from Galilee to Bethlehem. Paul's writing this book at about the time Nero is emperor. Nero was a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And uh, he didn't like Christians a whole lot. He was really brutal to the church. You know, lions and torches and all that kind of stuff. So Pax Romana didn't mean a lot to the Roman Christian. It didn't mean a lot to the Roman church. So Paul is giving kind of a juxtaposition. Peace with God, with God was a completely different story than what the Roman Christian experienced in the world. Through the comfort of the Holy Spirit, even in their persecution, they could feel and experience God's love. Look what he says. Through him, through who? Who's him? Jesus Christ. Through him, we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Him refers back to Jesus in verse 1. Through Jesus, we have obtained access into God's grace in which we stand. I have to admit, when I started reading, studying on this verse, I, I thought, well, this verse is a little difficult to comprehend. It just doesn't flow right, seemingly, to me. It was only after I began to look at what the Greek words that are translated into our English actually mean that the text began to make some sense. In the ESV, we read, have obtained access to his grace. Obtained, or access is the Greek word prosagogen, which is best understood as the privilege of reproach. So access is, is kind of a, of a neutral, null world, word, but through Jesus, we have obtained the right 
to approach the throne room of God. Remember in the book of Esther? I I love the story of Esther. And Mordecai tells her, look, you've got to talk to your husband, the king. But I can't just go in there. He's got to extend the scepter to me. I have to be given the right of approach because anybody approaching without that could be dead. So by the death of Jesus on the cross, by God justifying us, He has granted us the scepter, the right of approach. So in Rome, as they're being persecuted by Nero, they can have comfort in the reality that they have the right to step into the throne room of God and to pro- approach Him directly. Through the work of Jesus Christ, we've been granted the right of approach to the throne in the throne room of heaven. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I don't know how you can view that without seeing the importance of being at peace with God. When you're at peace with God, you can march right into the throne room of God and say, Dad, this is what I need. This is what's troubling me. This is what hurts. The things that dads want to hear. God has justified you and declared you righteous through the blood of Jesus. You now have the right of approach to the throne of the creator, sustainer of the universe. You are not some little ant-sized creature anymore you have direct access into the creator sustainer's throne god grants you the greatest privilege into the greatest place in the universe the throne room now go back to verse 2 of chapter 5 through him we've also obtained access by faith into his into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of god Paul continues that since we have peace with God and the right of access to the throne of God, we hope to share in God's glory. Don't think of hope here as a wishful thinking kind of thing. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. But rather as sure expectation. Because of the work of Jesus Christ, we have peace with God, the right to access the throne of God, and the certainty of being with God in glory. That all sounds pretty good, right? The word rejoice is often translated as boast. To prevent the negative connotation that goes with boasting, with the word boast, rejoice was used. The NASB, New American Standard Bible, uses exalt. King James uses boast. Wycliffe uses glory. The idea is that we can stand and proclaim to the world that we have the certainty of eternity in the presence of God, not because of what we have done, but because of what He has done. He has declared you righteous. He has justified you. We're not boasting in us. We're boasting in God. None of this is about us. It's all about God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Same word used in verse 2 is used here in verse 3, rejoice. Not only can we rejoice or boast in the hope of the future, but we can also rejoice or boast in our present suffering. That sounds counterintuitive. That we're rejoicing in the suffering that we have, that we go through. Let me explain. Look how Paul explains it. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. Look, let's look at what each of those words means. Suffering is the Greek word. Thilipsein, 
which in the context is better interpreted as tribulations. Not just sufferings, but tribulations. When Paul uses that word in his letters, he is almost always speaking about things suffered as a result of ministry. Stuff that you go through in ministry produces perseverance. Here's your first question of the, of the morning. How does interpreting the word Philipsian, suffering in the ESV and tribulations in the NASB, as the suffering resulted from your ministry, change your understanding of the passage? It's not just general suffering, it is something else. Oh, very good. You don't want to, it makes you so you don't want to like do like penance. I love that. As a kid that grew up in a Catholic home, in a Catholic church, penance was something that was real to me. I mean, I could say the, the Hail Mary and the, and, and the Lord's Prayer like that because I had to say them so many times. I like that. No penance. Microphone, Chuck. Oh, I your finger was up. Oh, that was sorry. me. Um, instead of us saying, woe is me, with the challenges or the struggles, we can actually realize that God's using sandpaper, actually use that for ministry or whatever. So it's not a negative thing, it's just a positive thing in a different aspect. Sanding down the rough edges. I love it. We can rejoice we can exalt God and boast in the tribulations that we receive because we're obedient to God and His direction. If you're suffering because of your ministry, you're doing it because you're, so, you're, you're obedient to God. We're not boasting about what we're doing. We're rejoicing that we're serving God and doing what He wants us to do. Here's a little free tip, tidbit. I'm not going to charge you for this one. Satan doesn't care if you're not doing anything for God. Satan will leave you alone. When Satan starts going after you, you have to start wondering, hey, what changed? Oh, I started doing what Jesus told me to do. I started doing what he wants me to do. I started being obedient. Well, Satan doesn't like that. And so you have this ability to rejoice in what God is doing in the tribulations that you have because they're a result of your ministry experience of being obedient to God. As we go through tribulations or suffering, we become stronger and we're able to withstand Satan's pressure more. Withstand it better. The more we go through the pressure, the more character we build. We sing that song often, Diamonds. How are diamonds made? Carbon under pressure. Character is proof of who you really are. The idea of the Greek word is that you have been tested and proven to be of solid character. There's also a sense in this word that God has sealed you or certified you through the proving. I, we, we like on Friday evenings to watch the gold shows, you know, where they, they dig the gold in, uh, in Alaska and the Klondike and stuff. And every once in a while, they'll show them smelting the gold. And what happens when they do that? They, they, they put the, the stuff in, in a kiln and it gets, gets liquid and, and all of a sudden impurities start coming out. And so when it's done, they can prove that it's pure gold. You've been proven by the heat of the fire you've been through. Think about that for a moment. You suffer tribulations because you're following Jesus and being obedient. That tribulation gives you perseverance or the ability to withstand the pressure. That builds character, which serves to identify you as being sealed by God as one of his kids, kids which gives you hope. That's what the Apostle Paul is telling us. Because we can go through the pressure of the suffering tribulations we can demonstrate we have hope for the future. Paul goes on in verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame 
because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul continues that Paul or that uh, that hope does not put us to shame. Here's your second question. Why would hope not put us to shame? What does he mean when he says that hope does not put you to shame? If it wasn't realized. Was it if if hope wasn't realized? Okay, very good. A believer's hope is centered on God and His promises, not on our own abilities. God can't disappoint you. Think about that. He can't disappoint you. He always has the best for us. Paul says that hope does not put us to shame, meaning the shame of not getting to where you thought you should be or having what you thought you should have. When we fail to deliver for ourselves or someone else, there is a sense of shame. Yeah, I'm going to come by your house tomorrow and I'll help you move that, that sofa. And then you sleep right through it. And you know, There's a sense of shame to that, right? When you disappoint people. Well, that's what they tell me. I've never done that. But, <laughs> but that can't be what God does. He's not capable of disappointing like that. As long as we're focused on Him... He can't disappoint us. Why won't we be disappointed by God? Paul gives us two reasons. One subjective and the other objective. The subjective reason is that God poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. This is the first time that Paul mentions Holy Spirit in relation to the life of the believer in the the book of Romans. This means that justification by faith results in receiving the Holy Spirit from God. That's pretty cool. God declares you righteous, justifies you, and gives you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It also means that through the communication that you now have, you have instilled in you a communication center called the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, he communicates with you, with our hearts, that we have assurance of God's love. God communicates to you that he loves you through the work of the Holy Spirit. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one scarcely, or one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare to even die. But God chose his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul moves from talking about the pouring out of God's love to describing the character of his love as a way to explain why he loves and why his love gives us hope. I love verse 6. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. It was at the right time when we were still weak, Jesus died for us. This is the objective reason we won't be disappointed by God's love. It came when we were weak, when we could not do it for ourselves. Paul says it's hard to conceive of a person dying for another person. But to die for an enemy, that's pretty hard. It does happen, but it's not the normal course of the way things happen. One commentator wrote that we must think of ourselves strapped to the chopping block. No way to escape. We can't break the binds on us. We've been declared guilty. The executioner stands ready to do his duty. When Jesus steps up, releases the chains, and lays down in the block for us, Jesus, who stood as the judge, now on the block, taking the penalty. That's what Jesus did for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Still telling us why we won't be disappointed by God, Paul says that since we've been justified by God through, his, through the blood of Jesus, we have a guarantee 
that we will not suffer his wrath. Some New Testament scholars attempt to make this verse speak of God protecting the church from the tribulation. But I think that strains the context just a little bit. The benefit of peace with God, our being justified by God, is that we escape eternal damnation, often referred to as God's wrath. It is true that we are protected from the tribulation, but that's not what this passage is talking about. This passage is talking in generality. We have been protected from the wrath of God, which is eternal. The fact that God saved you in the first place means that he will protect you and give you eternal life. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. When we were still enemies with God, he gave us peace. And we were reconciled to him. It's only through the death of Jesus that God was legally able to justify us. The penalty had to be paid. When Jesus paid the penalty, God was able to then forgive us. It's only through the death of Jesus that that could occur. But then, Paul adds to the end of verse 10, that now we are at peace and reconciled with God. We are saved by his life. The fact that Jesus walked out of the grave illustrates God's power. That assures us that we will always be at peace with God and he cannot disappoint us. Think about that for a moment. If Jesus had remained in the grave, would we have assurance of eternal life? No, it it, it couldn't exist. It takes the resurrected Jesus for that to happen and to give us assurance. More than that, Paul says, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation more than the assurance of eternal life we can now rejoice proudly uh, proclaim loudly or boast that we have been reconciled to god we are at peace with god no longer enemies with god justification does not bring perfection to our lives you all know that you know that once you were saved you didn't, didn't become perfect you still sin You still have problems. You still have issues. Justification is the status of being seen by God as perfect, not making you perfect. The reason that it's not a salvific issue for us is that Jesus in his life at the right hand of the Father constantly intercedes for us. I love that. The creator, sustainer of the universe is there talking to the Father on my behalf. Dad, you remember, he's covered in my blood. Can you, can, you, can, can you just hear Jesus saying that on your behalf? He's covered in my blood. Don't hold those sins against him. <coughs> You've been saved through God's grace, which has given you the right of approach to the throne. You have the right at any time and at any place to step into the throne room of heaven and say, God, here I am. Here's what's going on in my life. Here's what's hurting me. Here's what I want. He doesn't hold the scepter down and cast us out. We've been given the right of approach. He's given you peace with him for which we rejoice and boast of what he has done. You can boast about what he's done. You have been saved. Tell people. Be excited about being saved by what he has done. It's not boasting in what you have done. If you saved yourself, it would be boasting in you. But you didn't save yourself. It's boasting in him. When we return to Romans in a couple of weeks, we'll we'll get into a very long sentence. The whole next section is is a Brian Long sentence that we'll have to dissect and figure out how Paul is working through that as he begins to detail justification by faith. Next week, Lord willing, will be our threefold communion in which we'll we'll focus on our salvation. 
in the past, in the present, and the future aspects. As we sit down for a meal, as we wash feet, as we take the bread and the cup, the bread and the cup, the, the historic aspect, the past aspect of our salvation, Jesus on the, on the cross, as we wash feet, the daily aspect of our salvation, as we're forgiven every day for the sins we commit, and as we eat the meal, as we rejoice together, celebrating what will come in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we'll return back to the, to the book of Romans. Might even have a book of Galatians explanation in there. I forget where we are in the timeline. So when we return to Romans, we'll get back into this discussion of detailing justification by faith. Father, thank you for the picture that you have for us through Paul's writing in the book of Romans. Thank you that you show us that we're at peace with you. Oh, that warms my heart to know that I have the right of access to the throne of, of grace. That I have the right to go before you and say, this is what I want. And sitting right next to you, Jesus interprets that. And as Satan makes accusations against me, that Jesus is right there to correct the record for the Father. Thank you, Father, for that. And it's so hard to conceive of how all of that works, but we're so grateful that it does. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.